Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Rebecca Wright, uh, Director of Computer Science at Barnard. And I'm happy to welcome you here today for a Barnard Computer Science Seminar uh, and to welcome our speaker, Dr. Corey Toller Franklin from University of Florida. Uh, she is an Assistant Professor of Computer Science at the University of Florida where she directs the Graphics, Imaging, and Light Measurement Lab. She has a PhD from uh, Princeton in Computer Science, as well as a Master's from Cornell and an Architecture degree also from Cornell, uh, Bachelor's Architecture degree. Uh, before joining uh, the University of Florida, she was a UC President's Postdoctoral Fellow at UC Davis, as well as a researcher at the UC Berkeley <coughs> Citrus Vanatau Institute and uh, has also held positions uh, in industry at Autodesk, Adobe, and Google. Her research is in the area of computer graphics and vision uh, and uh, has uh, both foundational contributions there as well as applications in things like life science, biomedical research, and archeology. span And um, she will be talking to us today about her work on multispectral analysis and deep learning for life science and biomedical research. Franklin, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you for having me here. And so today's talk is all about algorithms that process and analyze multispectral data for applications in life science and biomedical research. So I won't let me advance oh, anymore. Should. Is stuck. Okay. Okay. It was so, okay. So I'm going to uh, I'm going to begin by introducing you to my area of research and teaching in computer graphics and computer vision. Then we'll look at some motivating examples and a study so you can see why this is an interesting and useful problem. Then I'll focus on two applications, looking at. Uh, reconstructed fading color in natural materials and finding cancerous tumors in tissue scans. So my PhD work started by going on site like an archaeological dig like this and acquiring real data and then processing the large volumes of data that we get into something that's useful. So using non-traditional imaging formats that have both color and surface orientation. So in the visualization, the tools, the upper part of the tools there in the, the upper left, you're seeing the color and in the bottom, you're seeing the surface orientation. So everything that's pointing towards you is blue. All the surfaces pointing upward is green or green and all the surfaces to the right are red and indigo is to the left. So we want to take that data and do things like use the additional information to do things like match or reconstruct fragments of artifacts. And my early work looked at taking uh, these types of information and making visualizations like, like this one that show the etching on the surface of the tools that you don't see in the color or bringing out the manufacturer's tag. So my teaching and research programs fall into the category of computer vision and computer graphics. And much of what I do is based with algorithms based in optics. And so from a computer vision standpoint, we're going to digitize and represent the world that we see around us using sensory devices and then process that data for the example uh, that I gave before, like for reconstructing frescoes, for example. And then from a computer graphics standpoint, we're going to make visualizations. You're going to see a more realistic visualization later. For this example, we're making a non-photorealistic visualization where we can control the imagery. So here you're seeing, we can blur the shape and the color. And to the right, you see, we can get that sharp shape around her nostrils. So how did I get here? So I've had experiences in both academia and industry. Um, a recurring theme throughout my path to get here is looking at challenges with working with real data and then using that to advance uh, technology and to advance computer science. And I also look at how we can apply those research results in real settings and develop strong teaching programs that really build upon what we learn from this research. So as uh, um, Dr. Wright said, I started in architecture at Cornell, thought I wanted to, to change the way technology worked for architects, and I graduated early, did my master's degree in computer, uh, focused on computer science, 
then I actually worked at Autodesk for a number of years on their 3D graphics team before going back and getting a PhD at Princeton. And my postdoctoral work was at UC Davis with an affiliation with UC Berkeley as a UC president's postdoctoral fellow. And so you guys here at Bernard are in a cultural mecca, right? There's great um, multidisciplinary uh, collaborations available. I uh, have a research associate appointment at the American Museum of Natural History, where I work on projects and collaborate there. It's pretty close to here. And I also collaborate with a scientist who has given me access to a lot of the data that you see at the Paleontological Research Institute in New York. And research and teaching are integral, integrally connected with my work. So here you see an NSF funded eye test award where I collaborated with the UF College of Education and the Museum of Natural History. And this project was pretty interesting because not only do I get to take the visualization algorithms that I work on and put them in the hands of high schoolers and middle schoolers, but we also were able to provide infrastructure and technology for STEM education to underrepresented groups in STEM. And my first courses that I taught at UF were focused on being able to open up my lab to both undergraduate and graduate students. They got to learn about the photometric techniques that I work on, but they get hands-on experience with the technology and the data that they produce, they use to develop algorithms. And I also teach the core computer graphics sequence at UF. So it's a great way to work with students at the undergraduate level, and then also introduce these tools and data structures and graphics to graduate students, and then advanced graduate students who go on to you know, do realistic image synthesis using integral, integral equations. So as with other graphics professors, I recognize a shift in the field. Here you see the 2019 um, Lion King movie. And as you can see, graphics is a pretty mature, mature field. We can make these visualizations pretty powerful and realistic visualizations. So what's happening is you have this influx of data, you've got high computing power, and you've got these efficient neural networks. So now we can learn from the data to make visualizations. And so I developed a new sequence of courses in AI and computer graphics that combines understanding the fundamentals of neural network architectures with computer graphics. And so I started with the special topics and then develop a more formal undergraduate and graduate courses, which were accepted at the Florida Statewide Numbering System. And these courses are also cool because the students get to work on the um, hypergator, which is the supercomputing uh, uh, cluster uh, that was donated by NVIDIA as part of this collaboration we have at UF. And these trends also pervade into medicine. And I teach a course to medical honors students that talk about the influence of AI in their professions and what it means for research and the work that they're doing. So this comes full circle. And here are some new research areas that I'm working on. These are two recent publications. One looks at AI and cancer detection, and the other looks at using neural networks and deep learning to study behavior in videos so that we can treat and also analyze, um, uh, treat and also diagnose neurological disorders. So now you know all about me, and so let's look at some research. Okay, so motivation, let's look at some examples. So much of the work I do is really motivated by research areas that use biological materials for their research and they use multispectral imaging to analyze that data. So for the three specimens that you see here, on the left, you're seeing the visible only part of that image. And on the right, you're seeing spectra outside of that visible spectrum. So for the shell fossil you see on the left, you don't see those color patterns in the color because it's 3 million years old, it's faded, it's gone, but you can see it under UV. For the near infrared in the center, those long near infrared rays, they penetrate through the surface and you can see the underside 
of that butterfly wing. And the same thing, you can see bone underneath the ceremonial paint. So you don't see the red on the right. Another interesting thing is how these spectra, like the UV reflected imaging, can tell you more about the composition of these materials. So here you're seeing uh, two uh, cabbage ripe butterflies. They're both being, uh, being viewed from, a, from under a visible light. But on the right, you'll notice that the male butterfly is darker than the female. And this is because on the left, we just have a clear filter. They're reflecting the light back. You get this equal brightness. But on the right, we put a UV filter there. So the actual pteridines inside the wing of that male absorb the UV light, whereas the female is reflecting it all back to the center. And so this is what they look like when you see them. And so the other uh, last interesting point is the way that when you look at these uh, butterflies, you see that they have their apparent color seems to change. If you look from, at them from different viewpoints or with different lighting. And this is because there are these translucent membranes and layers of them with scales on top. And what you get is this wave light interference with the size of that wavelength hitting these slits in those layers. And the actual destructive behavior happens at the blue wavelengths. So that's why you get this blue reflection happening. So there's a lot of subsurface scattering and things going on there. So I want to just tell you a little bit about a study that kind of catapulted all these projects that I'm working on. So we got together with some, um, some life science researchers in biology, forensics, paleontology, and pretty much we shadowed them. And we we're trying to look and see how they use multispectral imaging and if it would be useful to help them with some visualizations. And here's what we found. These are some findings across all of the disciplines. High dynamic range imaging was used to form, to, to get contrast in the infrared imaging so that you can see details, but you wanna suppress the visible. So when a forensic scientist heads out to a scene, they're gonna do infrared imaging, they're gonna see the heat in the system, they're gonna see the heat of bodies, and they're gonna look and they can do timing based on that. And they don't wanna see the visible light but they weren't able to control their imaging and they weren't able to prevent loss of details when they process their images. Another thing we found is bispectral reflectance was used to actually see latent or hidden biomaterials. So they actually have these fluorescent powders that do this and it's kind of neat. So in this case with the bispectral reflectance, you have a short wavelength coming in and a longer wavelength being admitted out. That's quite different from what we had with our near infrared where you had um, a long wave just going and penetrating beneath the surface and then coming out. Now, here's the interesting thing. They can do kind of interesting things here because they can look at the different patterns and say what species it is. But here's how they're actually reconstructing the color. They're using Photoshop and doing false color. And these things, they aren't the actual true color. So this is the problem that I'm gonna talk about next. And the last interesting thing we found was that microimaging was used to analyze structures. So in this case, they're gonna take, this is a leaf. And the leaves on the undersurface have what we call guard cells on them. They're little pores under the surface where you have two, two cells that kind of are flanking the two sides of that, that uh, cell. So what they would do is get an adhesive, pull it off of the leaf, get an imprint, and you're gonna you may destroy a specimen and then analyze it under the microscope. And so we wanted non-invasive ways of doing this. So now let's go ahead and let's just look at this problem. So reconstructing uh, faded materials. So reconstructing textures of realistic objects in nature in a way that's believable is pretty hard. And it's because you get these patterns on the surface that could vary from object to object. It also varies um, quite a bit within the actual pattern on the surface. So we wanna be able to do this, but another challenge we have is that details may be lost, color may be lost, it may be eroded. And actual graphics, applications that analyze these materials would really benefit from methods that could do reconstruction 
if you had only sparse information. And so what we did is we took on the challenge of saying, can we then make a pattern of something if the target object has non-corresponding patterns or even different color, or we don't know the color at all. And so what we did is we used two principles from biology and chemistry. The first principle is that when you have UV reflected imaging and you, well, this is actually UV fluorescent imaging. When you have that, um, that uh, interaction there, the actual bispectral map that you get or the intensity of that can record the material properties. And you don't need color to do that. And so not only can you tell the composition, but the intensity has a relationship between the color appearance and the actual materials that are involved. And so here you're seeing this is a pattern and we have mixtures of calcite and some other uh, different proteins there, but the composition is related to the hue and the concentration of the material is related to, related to the saturation. So what we're gonna do is take an example, we're going to learn those relationships, we're then going to transform that to the space of a target for which we know no color, and then we're gonna uncover the hue and the saturation. And there are lots of approaches to this, Several look at, in prior work, look at shape correspondences or perceptual differences, or some require some color priors. And some other examples don't allow you to do that real material analysis. And many methods, because they're procedural, they can't replicate a specific object. There's a lot of deep learning examples out there that I'm sure are effective, but we don't have the data to be able to do that in this domain. And so what we're going to do is take in a target and a source. We're going to compute the materials and the color for the source, but only the materials for the, tar for the target. We're going to project it into conformal space so we can compare the two shapes and the change of materials on those shapes. And then we're going to match patches between the two objects and see if we can make a transformation to recover those learned relationships to then get that result. And so here's the system. So we have this material measurement system where, remember, we don't know the color. So we need a way to associate the 3D geometry that we have with the actual pattern. And to do this, this illumination system gives us bands of constant uh, bispectral illumination or reflection on the surface for which we can then associate these low resolution textures with a high resolution measurement. And we use a laser triangulation scanner with a CMOS sensor, and we have a programmable rotating platform for this. And so those point sources, their UV radiation, we make them, we make it so that there's this insulin incident ultraviolet radiation. We place these points at a fixed distance above the object. And we uh, use these uh, LED rays from the UVA and the UVC spectra. So we work with 365 nanometers, 395 nanometers, and we have a linear high precision light source at 254 nanometers. And we choose the spectra of that light based on the type of material because that's gonna determine that material absorption and emission, that's gonna determine uh, how we can, you know, what wavelengths will give us the patterns that we need. Now, these are low cost devices. You can get this over the, you know, just these are shrink wrapped uh, packages, things that you can buy. They're not expensive. So we can't actually go in and change any parameters of these devices. So we need calibration to make sure we account for the differences in irradiance in those light sources that we're using. They're different manufacturers, different power. We want to minimize, uh, we, sorry, we want to maximize the contracts, contrast and maximize that irradiance. And we also need to avoid oversaturation or this underexposure we can get. And so we look at some laws when we actually calibrate. We know that according to the cosine law that the ultraviolet irradiance at a point on a surface depends on the angle of incidence and the actual distance of that source. And we use a digital ultraviolet meter to then measure every single light source at a fixed distance. And we adjust that power until we get the right calibration so they're consistent. And we have the numbers for the different wavelengths here. 
We also notice that we want, uh, we have the law that emitted intensity and spectra depends on the incident wave wavelength and irradiance, and that the incident angle on the surface will give us the cont contrast, right? You have to look at the curvature of that surface. So what we do is we have a primary array where we have three degrees of freedom, theta and phi, and we wanna maximize the brightness and maximize the contrast on our sensor. And that's where we position our primary light sources. And then we have the additional lights pointing at the surface. And so we have 28 positions from negative 35 to 35 over four orientations. And we do two passes to get both color. And here you can see the nice illumination bands that we get of the pattern. So here you're seeing, now you've got the 3D geometry, you've got your low resolution texture, you've got this really high resolution material measurement, and we can now go and reproduce the 3D geometry. And so we operate on patches, and this is the characterization of the patches within this pattern. So for a source object, we have foreground and background patches on the surface. We extract with pretty standard methods the shape, and we store the appearance, the material composition and concentration, and we compute additional geometric features with standard methods. But the interesting thing are these property distribution functions. So these functions allow us to understand the changing, how these properties change over the surface in relationship to, with respect to that curvature. And so, we can compute these uh, to look at how these um, materials are changing. And so for our source, we get the concentration, sorry, the concentration, the composition, the hue and the saturation, and we just get the materials for, this, for the target. And these are linear combinations of orthonormal basis functions. So when we actually apply that linear, um, the, the, the least square is fitting with spherical harmonics, we're gonna use a spherical, spherical harmonic transformation. We get a set of coefficient vectors that we can operate on and they give us the properties for curvature. And these are our material properties and our parents properties and just the materials and curvature for the target. And so now we know how the material is changing. Now we need to know what is the relationship between the composition and its hue on the source and the concentration and that saturation. So we use uh, another type of transformation. We use these property, we take the property distribution maps and then we do this, uh, we make these property distribution maps that actually incorporate a unique bidirectional mapping that allows us to transform a PDF, a property distribution on one object to another. Think about your two objects. They're gonna have totally different shapes. The materials, they're the same material, but they're gonna change between their shapes. So we need to transform them before we can compare patches. And so for these, we're actually gonna use a householder transformation. So this is a reflective transformation. And we're gonna end up with a set of matrices, TI, and the I is just for each of the spherical bands that we're operating on. And so now we have a transformation to take from our sauce to our target. And it's neat, this is invertible because that's how we're going to get our functions for hue and saturation in the end. And so now we can go and we can match all the properties with materials and shape. And then we can now say, okay, now we know the relationship between the actual appearance and materials and we can do a transformation into our target space, and we can then uncover the functions for hue and saturation and generate our reconstruction. And so this is just showing a reconstruction for saturation, a reconstruction for our hue. And so now we're able to say, okay, we have a set of coefficient vectors and functions we can use to get from our source to our target and then cover target saturation and target hue. And we got neat things in here, like we have different parameters we can add for, you know, if you wanna do a visualization, changing the amount of saturation or concentration, this is graphics. So, you know, users can do things like that. And so for evaluation, we wanted to make sure that from a single source, a single egg with its material and appearance properties, we could generate correctly a whole bunch of targets of different shapes and sizes. And so we take these measurements from our source, 
We know nothing about the color of our targets except for a ground truth comparison in the end. And so we get 2 million or 2.8 million per vertex color and appearance properties. And we are going to do an evaluation based on that. And so this is what they look like. I mean, my favorite, when my students showed me this, I almost dropped. This is really neat because this is not deep learning, right? We're not learning from data. We're just doing it the old fashioned way. And I was like, wow, we actually did it because if I showed you what it looked like before, <laughs> you know, so this is really great. And so now we're seeing, I'm showing you the actual measurements for the reconstruction on the top in each case, the ground truth on the bottom for all of these. And in each case, you're seeing the reconstruction on the left and the ground truth on the right. And so you can see a sample of the variety that we can uncover. And so we did a whole bunch of tests in the paper where we looked at keeping all the shape, scale, patterns, and colors similar to making them all different. And we looked at evaluating this by comparing our hue and saturation with what we computed for the ground, with what we measured, sorry, in our system for the ground truth. And we're pretty close uh, for these where things are very different for test five and test four. And the, okay, so this is really cool. So this is the neat thing. This is a complex material that has both fluorescent materials and non-fluorescent materials. So here you're seeing this willamite is brick red. So you're seeing this is, it's hard for you guys in the room to see, but the light, light's there, but this is brick red mostly. And then you've got calcite, which is white. So the brick red is fluorescent green. The calcite, which is white, is fluorescing red, and the franklinite has no fluorescence. So as expected, we can't reconstruct the franklinite because we're not designed for non-fluorescent materials, but we can uh, reconstruct the other two. And actually, what you're really seeing here is we get this really nice reconstruction of mostly brick red uh, for the franklinite. I mean, sorry, for the uh, willamite in that case. And so we get about a 92% accuracy for hue and saturation on the first test. We get an 82% um, hue and 79% for the complex materials. And the, the paper goes into a lot of details and analysis about why the saturation is low. It has to do with smoothing of the spherical harmonics. And so there's some analysis on that. But this is um, an example where we are reconstructing. So now I'm all the way back. We might tell you the reason we're doing this is I want to show you what we did when we did our pilot study. So here's a shell, has no color. We worked with uh, a scientist at the Paleological uh, Institute here in New York, and we were able to pick a modern descendant of that as our source. And then we're able to reconstruct and see if you see, we're able to actually, if you look at the patterns, we're, we're able to actually get the new pattern distribution that's quite different uh, from that source that was there before. And this is, this is the problem that um, was the hardest. We don't have ground truth for this, it doesn't exist. So this is why it was important that we used a single source and we had ground truth examples and we were able to reconstruct all these different colors on our eggshells to try and convince reviewers that yes, we can get the color right. And so these are just comparing with more traditional texture mapping. Obviously, you're not going to get that diversity that you see in ours. And then even with some style transfer methods that compete, they're not getting the new material distribution because they don't consider those materials. So now let's look at my final example, which is we're going to look at detecting um, tumors in this biomedical research type of area. So the goal is can we detect tumors in high resolution slide scans? And this is a collaboration with the College of Medicine at UF, UF in the oncology department. So our data is this chimeric material cell clusters of offspring. We have lots of these uh, tissue biopsies, but it's a challenging data set because of the, because of the actual tumors themselves. You notice that the tumor in the top left is pretty large and then the one all the way on the right is very small. And we wanna be able to adaptively detect those tumors. This tumor is very clear and you can see it where there are tumors in this uh, stain slide that are harder to distinguish. So they're non-discriminative. 
and it's also time consuming. You're gonna scan these, uh, these tissues with a slide scanner from Imperio. A technician sits in the lab, makes boxes around the tumors. Then the oncologist goes and he's gonna look at it and make a final determination. And this is time consuming, but we wanna use deep learning to speed it up, but we also want our deep learning algorithm to be fast. And there are just a slew of issues with deep learning in general high resolution images. These are 6,000 by 6,000 images uh, size. Um, so we have to make our patches to operate on it. These high resolution slides, how can we get all the contextual information with the low resolution information that goes in a neural network? We also have these tiny, tiny objects. And if you look at a CNN with a fixed receptive field, how are we gonna get those really small objects? So what we did is we implemented a system with multiple detection layers to get the broad range of tumor sizes that are in the actual receptor fields are changing. We've got a cascade residual inception model with a deconvolution model that's gonna actually, that module is gonna get local context as well as the background information. And we're gonna do it in a single shot, one pass to do it quickly. So our work is really related to object detection algorithms in vision that uh, detect objects and they're typically categorized as proposal-based or proposal-free. So with our proposal-based methods, you have two passes or two stages. First, you're gonna search, find what you're detecting, then you will classify. But we're interested in the more efficient proposal-free methods that do this all in one pass. And so we use a single shot multi-box detector or SSD as our base for the object detection. And it uses a VGG16 neural network for the object detection backbone. But before this, you know, SSD had been used for detecting objects in natural images. So you saw that. And, but it hadn't been used on microscopic images with the types of uh, tumor sizes that we had. And we also found that they weren't, these methods weren't really robust to this, these discriminative features and they weren't consistent. So what we do is we implemented or we added two really high resolution layers to the network. Because if you look at where the tumors are for a really small tumor, all the way up at this level, it's only gonna be a few pixels for detection. So we added these high resolution layers. We also note that the actual change in the receptive area uh, changes proportionally. So we're going to use the equal proportion interval uh, theory to actually adjust the aspect ratio of our detection boxes. And we're going to use a double set of those boxes to get a broad coverage. And so I'm going to introduce two terms before I show you our criteria and results. The first is in, in computer vision, if you're doing object detection, you often use this metric, intersection over union. So you're going to penalize. So here you have the predicted is green, the predicted box, and the ground truth where you actually detect the beta fish is red, but you're gonna penalize algorithms that get background information, and you're going to reward ones that are really close to the actual detection region. You hear me use this term. Oh, I also wanna point out that the scores go from zero to one, and it's this area of, area of overlap over union that you use to compute this. So you hear me talk about priors, priors, anchors, anchors. What do I mean? So when you do these detection uh, algorithms, you compute a set of priors or a set of boxes up front that tell you where, what you're gonna detect, right? And you wanna closely match the distribution of what you're trying to detect. And you wanna make sure that you have an effective region for that detection. So here's the criteria. We're going to make sure we have a small amount of anchors, yet we want to cover as many boxes as possible at 99%. We want to adjust the aspect ratio so that it differs from layer to layer depending on our detection criteria. And so we compute these anchor boxes based on the following equation. And the theorem in the paper states that the maximum anchors aspect ratio in each layer shall be chosen by this equation if the anchors are designed by the equal proportion interval principle. And so this is a function where we're computing that maximum uh, aspect ratio anchor. 
And it's going to be a function of the aspect ratio of the object. And we have our sets of objects that we're looking at, the aspect ratios. And it's also going to be a function of that IOU, that intersection over union that I introduced you to just now. And so we're going to compute this. We use statistics over our data to get um, our maximum um, aspect ratio for our objects at, at six. We have an intersection over union at 0 0.5. And then we can compute um, our actual anchor size. And to simplify, we just choose a discrete set of anchors at 1, 1.5, and 3. And so here's what the final design looks like. We've got some nice layers here. We added two high-resolution layers. Stride is just, if you imagine a convolution processing in a network, it's just the amount of pixels you move as you process. We've got our strides. We've got the anchor sizes. And we have this aspect ratio of the anchors that we're computing now through our process. And the receptive field, that's the region of the network that's going to actually do the detection. It also changes. So here's the distribution of tumors in our data, the black point cloud. And we're seeing our actual detection boxes or our anchor boxes. And the red is our primary set. The green is our secondary set to make sure we have additional um, detection. And we're looking at it for standard SSD and our approach. So the height of the pixels, height and pixels are shown in the Y, and the width of a pixel is shown um, on the X axis. So what you're seeing when you see these lines, all the anchors on that line have this. Uh, the same aspect ratio, but the scale could change. So what's neat is we're clearly getting more boxes in the region that we need to define more tumors than SSD. So we're gonna have a higher recall. So what does the actual network design look like? Well, this is SSD. It just operates on a feature map for our classification and regression. But we introduced this more complex module here where we have this cascade residual um, inception model and we're able to now get local contrast information. Another thing you'll notice is, is you see that the feature map, this information is skipping over to down here. We borrow for, from residual networks where these networks skip over some layers. If doing training, that layer's not learning, you can skip over it and speed up your learning process. And we also then add this deconvolution layer because now we uh, deconvolution module because now, hey, we say we can get local contrast. We also want to get um, some background information. And together, the contrast in the local region and this background gives us uh, a better chance of getting non-discriminative features. And so here's what the experimental setup looks like. We have 30,000 patches extracted from our microscopic scans. We get 300 by 300. It's the size of our pixels. We have chimeric cells which are the tumors and they range from eight to 300 pixels in size. We separate the training from testing. You don't wanna bias your training by letting it see the test set or vice versa. And um, we operate on a GTX NVIDIA 1080 Ti GPU for three days and a two additional days of fine tuning. Remember we operate on that VGG network. So since we're on that VGG network, we want to use it as our base. We have to test out better hyperparameters and reweighting for our data. And I just want to say with the hypergata, this happens in no time now when we actually run it on the hypergata. And so here are some experimental results. On the left, you see the different methods, starting with a proposal based method to SSD and then R3 adaptive modules. And we look at precision, which is the tumors that you correctly found over all that you've detected. And we find that we actually get a similar precision to SSD. And all the SSD methods are much better at precision than the RCNN model. Recall, that's how much uh, you've actually detected. And so this is pretty high for RCNN, but the problem with this is that the precision is low. And so you're gonna have some false uh, detections there. Another thing is that I want to point out is that we get the best overall average precision. 
and that the key thing is we keep about the same precision as SSD and we get a higher recall. And so let's look at this another way. This is the precision recall where we have our CNN way at the bottom. You have the SSD methods, the standard in red, and then you see in the Cayenne, you see the SSD adaptive, you see just the inception module one as that, well, the inception model is the dotted line that you see, and then the straight magenta line is with the foveal detection. Now students often, oh, so I wanna say this is precision recall. So you're seeing the precision on the y-axis recall on the x-axis. So ideally you wanna flat line across the top because you wanna recall as many as you can for the highest precision that you've got. Students look at this and they always say, oh, Dr. Tall Franken, that's not so impressive. I mean, you know, so this is what I tell them. Okay, if you're down here and you are a patient with cancer, you don't want to be have your tumor flight and go through some invasive process to find out it was a false alarm. If you're up here and you have a teeny tiny tumor, it's not progressed that much, and an algorithm is overlooking it, and you would have had a chance at treatment, you will value that difference. And so this is why it's important for the field that we're in. And so I just want to conclude by saying that we looked at a study for that motivated all of this work, and we showed how we can use the spectral data to reconstruct complex materials using UV imaging. And then we talked about AI for cancer and AI for working with other medical data sets. So the next stage of my work actually combines quantum mechanics theory, looking at molecular and atomic level interactions in biological materials with deep learning and for life science and biomedical research and has really cool imp um, implementation, I mean, sorry, implications for uh, reconstructing materials with methods that are non-invasive and some really interesting uh, results for detecting biomarkers for detecting cancer. And so that is all I've got. I wanna thank all of you for having me here at, at uh, Bernard and for, um, uh, I want to thank all of you ha for having me here and for uh, Columbia. And I completely apologize, Bernard, for that spelling. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I, when I saw it, I was like, oh my gosh. But anyway, thank you for having me, Bernard. <laughs> and thank you for having me, Columbia. See, I'm human. And, and, and Helderman Lab, Divine Lab, the American Museum Industry, all my collaborators who let me touch their precious data and let me have it in my lab is cool. So thank you. Thank you so much for that talk. Uh, and we have time now for questions. Yeah. So can I ask you a question about the, the future work? So um, it, it sounded really cool and I just want to know more. Um, so is what you're suggesting that you're coming up with new uh, new imaging techniques using these novel approaches? So what is happening is I actually made a prototype where we're able to reconstruct we are able to take like a sample of like a dinosaur skin embedded in clay, and we're able to reconstruct a model that simulates how the, the, the atomic level interactions occur, and we can visualize it so that we can distinguish what's the material of the dinosaur skin versus the clay. And so that's where I came, that's where it started, but biomarkers in cancer are proteins, so we can model them with these, these complex things. And um, and actually detect where the markers are and the implications are amazing. Thank you for the uh, the second part about uh, cancer tissue and uh, imaging. Uh, I wondered if you can provide some details about what kind of, is that H and E staining? What kind of tumors? What kind oh, of so okay, so the chimerics. The chimeric cell, so these are maternal clusters. So let me tell you a bit. So the doctor that I work on with, he works on really rare pediatric cancers. So um, I guess there, there are some, uh, some maternal cell clusters that indicate whether a particular disease is going to develop in vitro. And so they, um, so yeah, so they, so these are actual maternal cell clusters inside of, you know, uh, you know, an embryo. And so, so that's what, and they, they can be cancerous. And so that's one thing. And then what was your second? What's the staining? What are oh, so I can't remember. So, okay. So 
The specific staining, staining that he uses for that one, I'm not sure. It's something that he uses in his lab, but this is all part of aminohistochemistry, and they have a whole bunch of staining for either finding different proteins or other things, but I don't know the exact name of the, the stain he told me, but I don't know the exact name of that particular stain. And you mentioned tissue and, and risk. So is that mouse data or is that? So these are from mice. Okay. These are, yes, so these are these are mice that, so what he does is he he grows the, the tumors inside the mice and then he does the, and and sometimes he puts human, I guess it's human uh, cells, I don't know how it works, but I know that he takes the sample. So I'm not a medical doctor, but he, I know that he grows the tumors inside of them and he, he uh, does the biopsies and he can actually, it's neat because he can trace the actual development through. Um, yeah. Thanks, Lisa, on Zoom. But the reason I yep. said is oh, to have a database of human cancer that that we work with, and if I, I could be wrong, but I believe that he, because we were talking about tracing those as well. So, Thanks. great, Lisa. Yep. Hi. Sorry for not meeting you in person. I uh, woke up with a sore throat today and didn't want to get everyone sick, but. Um, yeah, so regarding your project about being able to reconstruct patterns, like biological patterns in the shells and things like that, do you think that your methods could be used to generate like novel patterns that don't already exist? Um, yeah, so I didn't show you a result here, but I have a result in the paper where, like, for example, so I'm in computer graphics. So, so to attract the computer graphics community that was reviewing my paper, I did an example where we took a synthetic object and then we actually painted onto it uh it's called texture painting we painted the intensity on it and we kind of fabricated what that you know intensity would be and what that material would be and then we simulated it for like and that would be for like a gaming environment you want to make a naturally looking object or uh, virtual environments and things like that and you know so we looked at different types of problems and yes it yeah you can do it so we, we have an example in the paper cool thanks any more questions in the room? Uh, sure. Oh, wait. Uh, so for the first part of you presented, you mentioned that, that any deep learning methods would require a large amount of data that you that you may not have access to. So it seems that you you were able to formalize the physical principles that that um, that govern the a reflection and an absorption of light. A, given that, would it be possible to simulate? Yes, paper two. <laughs> paper two. Yes, okay. paper two. So paper two actually uh, has two parts. Like we actually gave the system into the hands of someone, an expert, and had them actually label a bunch of stuff so we can do a deep learning thing. But yes, we actually looked at creating a model that could look at the actual physical progress. We don't have a publishable result yet, but that was the next paper doing, and that paper is all going to be evaluation using deep learning. Um, hi, thanks for your talk. Um, I had a question about, um, it seems like you interface a lot with different disciplines, but in a very deep way. Could you talk a little bit about the methodology and the process of working with folks in the healthcare industry and the life sciences? It takes a lot of time. Yeah, it takes a lot of time to nourish it. So I don't know if you noticed, my background is in architecture. So I came from a field that was very different from computer science. And the whole reason I took this path is because I worked in industry and I was a, a software engineer and I worked um in you know in more uh architectural design environments and i actually formulated a position where i worked with executives at both autodesk and um these architecture firms to kind of interface and speak between the two because i speak both languages so what i would say about that is it's about fostering relationships and it's about um understanding their need the, the needs of the field that you're working on it's about respecting their data and um, so um, the neat thing is like, it's in, when my students and I have meetings, we actually sit in meetings with the neuroscientists. And so we get to see what they learn and what they do. So it's kind of like we get an additional knowledge 
But then, you know, I had a question about the tumors, you know, and I always feel shaky trying to like talk about what the oncologist does. So it's about being able to interface with different professions being able to understand the challenges they have and being able to make a connection about what could this solve in computer science or what problems in computer science it could solve. But it really does take time. I mean, these relationships took years to build and it took years before the work came out. Any more questions? All right, seeing none then, uh, please join me in thanking again, Dr. Thank you so much.